Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to uh, particularly thank uh, Stephanie for a very nice letter. Um, she was uh, in one of my classes, and the fact that I can still get a nice letter from somebody who <laughs> was in one of my classes, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, as she suggested, the topic that I've been given is uh, broadening opportunities for minority people in economic life. And I guess what I want to do is to say from the outset that to the extent that I deal with that topic, I'll be talking mostly about um, the black experience. And, and I don't, and I'm saying that just so that people won't think that I feel that the black experience is the sum total of the minority experience. I don't. And that's also why I tend to talk about the non-white uh, entity that I know the most about because I feel a lot of times people just say minority and assume that all minority people have the same problems, the same outlook, and et cetera, and that's simply not true. So uh, I just wanted to let you know that from the outset, that that's where most of my comments are going to be directed. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. made the statement that freedom is the capacity to deliberate to deliberate or to weigh alternatives. And I would suggest that at the core of the myriad of um, decisions and conditions that are necessary to weigh alternatives in the truest sense is relative economic independence. And that relative economic independence for most of us is impossible without employment. That relative economic independence is impossible when you are poor because freedom or the ability to weigh alternatives is tied into the reality of one's economic conditions. And I stand before you extremely worried, indeed frightened, about the difference between the picture of optimism that is infused in certain sectors of this country's population and the reality of hopelessness that characterizes other sectors. The fact is that as we sit here today in these reasonably comfortable surroundings, we must fully grasp the fact that there are more than 35 million U.S. citizens living below the poverty line. And some 8.5 million are unemployed, and there are millions of others who are no longer even counted in the statistics because they've given up looking for a job in despair. Those of us who are here this afternoon must not let the battles that some of us have fought and lost make us weary or hardened or numb to the point that we too begin to accept these kind of figures as, quote, the price that we must pay for progress. We must continue to press home the point that behind these figures are real people, millions of people without hope, people suffering from hunger and malnutrition, increased incidents of family tension, domestic violence, alcoholism, child abuse, crime, mental disease, homicide. We must not let America rest on the promise or the premise that, quote, happy days are here again. Because in reality, in today's America, rich people are getting richer with the promise that someday, some of it will trickle down to the rest of the people. What is critical for us to understand here is the causal relationship between unemployment, underemployment, and poverty. Furthermore, we must be absolutely clear about the fact that when you are poor, it places you in the center of the proverbial vicious circle. That is to say that if you are poor, you lack resources. And in America, resources are critical to the exercise of power. And power is crucial. 
if one is to change his or her position or status in this society. The point is that poverty is debilitating and destructive to the human spirit. There's nothing quaint or redeeming about being poor or, quote, disadvantaged. I stress this because I find today that there's a tendency to intellectualize away the harsh realities of being poor in America. Nationally, we're facing a very difficult situation. The economy's labor market is structured into good jobs and bad jobs. And the growth in this country is in the lowest category, i.e. bad jobs. I was reading a March 90, 85, 1985 issue of Christianity and Crisis magazine. And the article was entitled, The Mission of Schooling, Quality and Equality. And it said, and it's a relatively long quote, but I want to quote it to you. Today we are faced with a shortage of jobs in a wide range of skill levels, not a shortage of qualified and motivated workers. We have a labor market with the middle dropping out and with competition at every level, contrary to the human capital theories, they're so optimistically uh, putting forth the notion that there will be more room at the top to compensate for these losses. The fact is that the labor market of the future cannot any longer be pictured as a bell-shaped curve but rather as a bottom heavy hourglass. And the emerging top will include only a small elite stratum of well-paid professional technical employees who themselves will face growing problems of skill devaluation and intense competition. On the bottom of this hourglass will be a shrinking number of blue collar workers faced with continuing reduction in labor standards. The bottom will also include a growing segment of relatively skilled but low paid employees in paraprofessional, technical, administrative, and service fields. A large proportion of these employees will be women as well as the traditional secondary workforce of low skill low-paid service jobs, which are dead-in, unstable, and rapidly expanding. In addition, there will be a swelling pool of structurally unemployed workers joining the vast reserve of irregular workers and, quote, hardcore unemployed. And on that bottom are a disproportionate number of non-white people in this society. In trying to prepare for this talk this afternoon, I did a little research looking at the Urban League's state of black America for 86 and several other studies that have been done on problems related to employment and poverty and income for blacks uh, in America. And just for a moment, let me cite some statistics to give you a picture of what it is we're facing. Since 1975, the annual average black unemployment rate has been 15.2%. There has been no year between 1975 and 1986 where black unemployment was less than 12%. Since 1981, the black unemployment rate has averaged 17%, and there's not been a year in the last five when black unemployment was less than 15%. Unemployment rates for whites over the last 11 years have averaged only 6.7%, and the last five years, the average is 7.3%. These unemployment figures reflect a situation that has been devastating 
for all black demographic groups, adult males, adult females, and teenagers. Black males over 20 have averaged a 12.9% unemployment rate since 1975, 15.4% during the last five years. That rate is 8.9 percentage points higher than for white males. Black females over 20 have averaged 12.9% unemployment rate since 1975, 14.4% during the last five years, compared to a white female rate of employment that is 8.1% less than those numbers. Black teenage rates have averaged 41.3% since 1975, 44.1% for the last five years. That is 26.4% higher than white teens. When you talk about poverty, almost 61 out of every 100 black families with heads under 25 were in poverty in 1984. That's 25% higher in 1984 than in 1980s. For families headed by individuals over 25, about 29 out of every 100 families were in poverty. That's 19% higher in 84 than in 1980. For whites, families headed by persons under 25 had a poverty rate that was 37 percentage points lower than those of black families. Families with heads over age 25, the poverty rate was 20 percentage points lower than that of black families. When you look at income, blacks were 12.4 percent of the families in 1984, but we received only 7.6 percent of family income. In 1984, the median black family had about 56 cents to spend for every one dollar white families had to spend. This was two cents less per dollar than blacks had in 1980, almost six cents less than blacks had in 1970 in comparison to whites. Families with no wage earners saw the ratio black families, saw the ratio of their income to white families decline from 48.5% in 1980 to 40.4% in 84. One wage earner from 57.5 to 53.5, two wage earners from 81 to 78.5. This income depression has been most severe on those with the lowest income. Compared to 1980, the poorest 20% of black families had 22% less purchasing power in 84 than in 1980. The second poorest quintile had 15% less income while the third poorest had four. Now, I was looking for something that could bring this home, you know, better, if that's possible. And so I was reading a magazine uh, called Focus, put out by the Joint Center for Political Studies. And William O'Hare, who's a senior research associate, at the Joint Center, made a very important point. He said nearly everyone, bureaucrats, politicians, and researchers, use personal income in comparing the economic status of blacks and whites. But income alone does not provide a full measure of economic status. Personal wealth or accumulated assets is an important part of the picture. And he talked for a while about these various assets. Then he went on to talk about the distribution of wealth. And he said that the wealth of blacks and whites is distributed differently amongst the various categories of assets. I want to zero in on one of the categories that he talked about, and that one was called financial assets, which includes cash, checking accounts, savings accounts, savings bonds, CDs, loans, stocks, mutual funds. Only 7% of black wealth is invested there, while 28% of white wealth is composed of such assets. 
And while 95.3% of white households have financial assets of some kind, only 78% of black households have this type of asset. So that this means that 22% or roughly 2 million black households have absolutely no financial assets. Now that's the national picture. When you look at Milwaukee, and if you look at, I looked at two things, the current population survey, the last one which was put out in 1984. And what was really interesting was trying to look at how they dealt with who was employed, who wasn't, why, and so forth. So that they had four basic categories. Employed persons who were civilians 16 years and over who were either at work, at a job or business the last week when they took or when they uh, did the survey. Or they were temporarily absent from work due to illness, vacation, strike, or other personal reasons. Housework, volunteer work, school work was not included. Unemployed persons were civilians 16 years of older not at work and not otherwise with a job who were either actively looking for work during the last four weeks prior to this survey and were available to accept jobs or were laid off but waiting to be called back. Discouraged workers were not looking so we didn't even put, they're no longer even included in the statistics having to do with employment. When you look at Milwaukee the civilian non-institutional population, 16 years of age plus, is something like 385, 300 for whites. In the labor force, but unemployed, was roughly 30,400, or 7.9% unemployment rate. For males between 16 and 19, that was a 13.8%. And for males between 20 and 24, 36.6%. For females, 16 to 19, 14.9%. 20 to 24, 18.9%. Not in the labor market, but 16 years of age. For reasons other than keeping house, going to school, or unable to work, was 39,500 people. The total number not in the labor market then was 127,000, and of that 127,000, 39 were either keeping house, going to school, or unable to work. When you look at the black situation, the civilian non-institutional population, 16 years of age plus, was 91,500. In the labor market, but unemployed, was a 26.7% rate of unemployment, or rough uh, 14,100 people. Males 16 to 19, 23.6, 20 to 24, 59%. Females 16 to 19, 61%, 20 to 24, 42.7%. Now that's crucial because we are a young population. So as bad as that sounds, it's really worse because of the age of our population. Some more recent statistics show that the situation is actually worse today than it was in 1984. So that the minority population today is 30%, the black unemployment rate is 27.9%, as compared to a white unemployment rate of 6%. Of the 25 largest urban areas, Milwaukee's black unemployment rate was second only to Detroit. In December of 1986, the national black unemployment rate was 13.7%, and we're looking at almost a 28% unemployment rate in the city of Milwaukee. What does all of this mean? Well, to me, it means that we, as a city, are in deep trouble. Because I, I didn't even talk about uh, welfare. I was sitting in a cabinet meeting up in Madison a little over a year ago, 
And this was before Tommy started talking about welfare reform. And, and his plan actually he got from <coughs> Linda Rivets, which is really interesting. But, it, but, it, but in any event, um, I was sitting there uh, sort of minding my own business. And they passed around a sheet. I was the only black person in the room. It was a closed cabinet meeting. And they started talking about welfare. And so I perked up then. And I start looking at the figures. Out of 160,000 black people in the city of Milwaukee, 80,000 are on some form of welfare. 80,000 out of 160,000 population. We've argued for years about where's the prison population going to be, where the prison is going to be, and I look at the fact that in Milwaukee, 85% of all the black people who live in this state are in the city of Milwaukee. That we're in a state that's 4% of the total population, and we're now approaching a prison population of something like 55%. Last week, I talked to 75 ninth graders from a public school in Milwaukee, all black who were interested in health careers. Of that 75 people, there were three boys. Three boys. Yesterday, I spoke at Ethan Allen, and I went in the gym, and that's where all of them were, at Ethan Allen. And if they ain't at Ethan Allen, and they're over 18, they're at Fox Lake, Green Bay, and Walpon. And so you talk about, do we have a problem in Milwaukee? I would say to you that Milwaukee has this window period because Milwaukee is not Chicago, not Newark, it's not a lot of places. But if we don't do some things real soon, this window period or this space is rapidly closing on this city. I sat down with a hundred, about a hundred or so of a gang kids. And I had a 14 year old boy look me in the face and tell me that he no longer cared anything about his own life. Now that's frightening enough, except when you understand the implications that if somebody doesn't care about their life, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what they think about yours. And when we've got young people in this city who have reached this point, we are in deep trouble. And McMurrin can call me all of the names that he wants. He can conjure up whatever he wants. The reality is the Milwaukee public school system is not educating the vast majority of black children. That we are producing year after year graduates, non-graduates who are functionally illiterate. And that we can sit here if we want and congratulate ourselves on how great our integration program is and isn't it nice that we all love each other and blah, 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 and not look at the results educationally. And 15 years from now, this city is going to be a wasteland in the center city or the, the surrounding, depending upon how gentrification operates within the next two decades. Now, let me try and talk about a specific instance that's getting ready to come up that at least raises some possibility. The Wisconsin Department of Development did a research project that showed that small business development in Wisconsin is in fact the source of future economic growth. In fact, this study shows that very small businesses, those with 20 or less employees, provide the majority of the jobs that are generated in Wisconsin. Minority and women-owned businesses are a very small part of the small business community in this city. 
the development and nurturing of these businesses ought to be a special concern to every Milwaukeean, irrespective of race or gender. Because according to the 1984 President's Report on Small Business, the research shows that small minority businesses hire minority people before small non-minority business hire minority people. So that in April, on the ballot, we are faced with an extremely critical economic issue. And that issue is Charter Ordinance number 55. The purpose of this charter ordinance is to increase participation of minorities and women-owned businesses in the awards of city contracts for construction of public improvement and purchases of service, goods, and supplies. City departments could award a contract to minority or women-owned business if a bid from that business did not exceed the lowest actual bid by more than 5%. Furthermore, 28% of the total dollar value of city contracts in any given year would be awarded to these businesses either through prime contracts or subcontracts. The 28% goal would be achieved gradually over a three-year period. 9% of the total dollar value the first year 18% the second year, and 28% the third year, and every year through December 31, 1996. This ordinance creates a minority business enterprise committee comprised of nine members consisting of an alderman appointed by the president of the council, the city controller or designee, the director of budget and management or designee, a members of the mayor's staff, four citizen members appointed by the mayor and the city's affirmative action officer. In addition, the city purchasing agent, the commissioner of public works, and the commissioner of city development, or their respective designee, will serve on the committee in an ex officio non-voting capacity. This committee will conduct hearings on requests for wa waivers from the requirements of the program and appeals from the decision of the MBE coordinator. Now, Milwaukee is getting ready to go through another very interesting thing based on this ordinance. Because the real serious question is going to be, are, are people really interested in seeing blacks do something? Are they really interested in seeing blacks get off of welfare? I've been hearing all these speeches lately about how y'all need to do something for yourselves and you got to do something about your problems and blah, 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 blah. Now is going to be the time to find out if people really want that to happen or that's just another smoke screen that folks throw out. Because we have an opportunity here to say to black business people, to women-owned businesses, that says more to the communities that they're going to be involved in hiring, that we realize that if, in fact, you are to deal with welfare, you're to deal with a number of economic problems, you must have the wherewithal to do that. Employment is critical. We know that small businesses create the most jobs. We, can, we believe that with an ordinance like this, it will help in the development, the creation, and the sustenance of small minority-owned businesses that can become a critical part of creating new jobs that will take people off of welfare roles and give them meaningful employment. Now, if that's the case, then this ought not to be a racial issue. This ought to be an issue of what is in the best interest of all of us who live in this city, and when are we going to say positively through action rather than words that we believe that all of the citizens of this city ought to share in the resources that this city has? So that this is a very critical issue. And all of us need to educate ourselves about the importance of this ordinance, what this ordinance could mean, and what it would mean for this city to turn down this ordinance and not be fooled by demagoguery into thinking that this is somehow some unfair thing that's being 
castigated against white males and that they're being discriminated against because no longer will they have exclusive right to all of these resources. And that's the issue. And so if you're going to talk about broadening economic opportunities in Milwaukee, this becomes a put up or shut up issue in April. So that what we're talking about now is understanding that the economic issue is important not only because of job creation, but also because what it does is it gives people control over resources which are needed and which are crucial and key to determining participation in the broader social processes of this community. Because in fact, economic power is critical within the political arena. The political arena is where clear decisions are made in a way dealing from a power standpoint as to how resources are distributed so that these two things are dialectically linked. So what I would suggest to those of you who are here today, those of you who are Milwaukee citizens, those of you who can vote because you declared yourself a citizen or whatever, that I hope that you will take a hard look at this ordinance and that you will recognize its importance to the topic that you asked me to talk on. One final point and then we can deal with questions. As many of you know, um, I've argued about what is or is not happening as far as education in Milwaukee. Now, I just want to tell you the trip that I've been on so you can understand at least partially where I'm coming from. In 1978, we made the charge that blacks in the, in the public school system were being systematically undereducated and that what was happening to them was being hidden in aggregate figures. And we asked the school board for dis aggregated data. They first lied and said they didn't have it. We went to court and they produced it. And for the first time when we looked at high schools, it wasn't a case that you'd see uh, a king on the top, that's, you know, for the college bound. And then they'd always have north on the, on the bottom and they'd always say north is terrible and it's terrible because it's all black and here are the figures. Once we got the figures, we found out that in 14 out of the 15 high schools in the city of Milwaukee, black kids have a grade point average less than a C. After being told that this wasn't true, when we got the data, we could see for the first time what was actually happening on the end of the bus ride. I asked McMurrin, why don't you put this data out and let the community know what's happening. He told me that, A, we don't want to publish this because we were asking for achievement scores at the elementary school levels. He told me that, Howard, we can't put this out because, one, black parents couldn't stand it once they actually found out what's happening to their kids. If I'm lying, you know, I know, you know, the press going to call them, did you say this? I'm saying he said it. The second thing that he said was that this would be fodder in the hands of the racists because this would prove that black kids are incapable of learning. And the third thing that he finally said some weeks later was General Motors don't put out statistics about its failures. So that was the first thing, okay? So I'm a separatist, I'm this, I'm that. That's what this man who's the superintendent of this school system said. So we go on. After telling us that there was no gap in the learning, in the achievement levels at schools, the state spent $350,000 to do a study of the school system and came out and showed that there were tremendous gaps in achievement levels between blacks and whites at every level of the system and that indeed the thing was getting worse as you went up in grades. Last summer, the county 
tested 2,039 students who were part of a summer training program. They found that less than 3% of those students, mostly black, were reading at their current grade level. And that in fact, at the seventh grade, they were 1.8 years behind, or grade levels behind, I'm sorry. And at the 12th grade, they were 4.5. So after telling us for years that there was no gap, when we fought for the P5 program, McMurrin came out with a list of what they now call gap schools. First there was no gap, now they got a name. The name is gap schools. They said there was no real disparity in these numbers. The last test booklet that they put out does nothing but talk about how they have closed the gap in the disparity and they take particular pride in saying that we have closed the black, non-black gap in the lowest achieving levels. Now, why am I raising this? I'm raising it because I'm going to be like a bulldog on his behind. And that I have not ever before the last year said that I think that it's time for him to go. That's a lie when he said I've been saying it for years, but I'm saying it now. And I'm saying it because I know that if this school system were 100% white, and that there were figures like what everybody in this city knows, there ain't no way that that person would still be the head of this school system. And to continue it is racist, and we have to say that, and I don't care who don't like it. And so I say there's a time for a change, and it's all connected. There's a time for a change at, the, at all levels of this school system. And I happen to be supporting a particular candidate. Whoever you support, go out and vote for him. But the incumbent said that she wanted this race to be a referendum on whether or not this school system is functioning in the best interest of the majority. I say right on. Let's <laughs> let this vote be a referendum. And so if you think that this system is meeting the needs of the majority of the people, then vote for the incumbent. If you think not, then vote for the individual that's running against her. And let's let this be a referendum, not on the settlement, not on desegregation. Let's let it be a referendum on the crucial issue facing this city in the next two decades, and that is the quality of the students that it's turning out of its public schools. That is the issue in 1987. So that, again, I thank you for the invitation to speak. I fight for this city actually because I love it. Because this city has given a lot to me, and I know it can be better. But in order for it to be better, it's got to include all of us. And I do not see legitimate and valid criticism as something that ought to be hidden because of our various positions, and that we ought to be afraid to speak out on what is actually happening in this city. I don't see criticism of the school system as criticizing black kids, as McMurrin says. Because every time I raise a criticism, it gets turned around, he's criticizing our black kids. No, I'm criticizing him and the system, not the kids. Because that's a cop out. I ask them, how come we can't do better? They tell me what's, what's going on in Gary. I don't live in Gary. I don't want to compare Milwaukee to Gary. I want to compare Milwaukee to Shorewood, and to Wauwatosa, and to West Allis. I want to know why it is that this can be the best school system statewide in the nation, and we producing kids who can hardly read and write. Explain that to me. And so what I'm saying to you is that if Milwaukee is to become a city of conscience, a city that is indeed prepared to involve all of its citizens, in every aspect of this city, 
then the April election has several crucial issues and two of them are extremely important, the charter ordinance and the school board elections. Because I believe that these issues are a real key to broadening opportunities for minority people in economic life in the city of Milwaukee. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Ford. We won't have time for questions today um, on, a, on a large group basis because of class schedules for folks. We really appreciate all of you being there, being here, and particularly Dr. Fuller for sharing with us today. Thanks for coming.